Did anybody? The documentary on feral children. Or you didn't have the time. Are you there? <laughs> By the way. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't have the time, but I, I'll check it later. Yeah. Ah, oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Erika. Yeah, teacher. Um, well, it was a video. It was it's a documentary on the theories on language acquisition, language development, and the importance of um, social interaction when developing language, and how to certain extent language might define um, our perceptions towards reality. It was uh, good for you to explore because it has to do with all the theories we are um, shedding light on for discovering characteristics, not only for children, but for every single language learner, you know, adults, young adults, or, um, or, or, or children in our case. Um, the video was really interesting. It was a documentary, as, as I told you. And the documentary um, ex explored four different cases of children. One of them became very famous because um, it, it, it was this girl who was able to develop a different language by her own without any interaction. And how the interpretation of her sounds actually uh, provided insights into the development of a new language and what it was for a couple of hypotheses and theories that were established before having the opportunity to explore such a difficult case like this one you know it's almost impossible to have somebody who's been isolated who's got no interaction at all so they took advantage for doing research from this cruel situation and um, well the critical period hypothesis was questioned you know it was controversial the language acquisition device theory by Chomsky and by other linguists and the behaviorist approach as well so um, well it was insightful for the purposes of reflection I also share with you um, a video on um, routines, little read. I hope you had a time to check it. It was from a, a teacher from a uh, Cyber Republic, I think, as far as I remember, uh, from the BBC, and it was for um, establishing agreements and dynamics in the classroom for little children to get used to working together. Um, well, I, I think um, she provided with a couple of ideas that could be useful for us to implement in our classrooms. It was um, interesting, you know, I really found it interesting. And I think um, it would be nice if you could uh, give it a go. Um, I think I also share another video, but I can't remember which one I share, but I got it here. Um, no, that was so. Yeah. Well, if you haven't, well, you, maybe you will find uh, some room for uh, watching them and reflecting because uh, everything has to be represented in your following tasks which are on language acquisition and language learning with different perceptions from crashing. But before checking that, I would like to go over social constructivism. Um, the idea of sharing with you L1 language acquisition theories and the documentary and the videos I, I shared was to focus on the importance of more knowledgeable peers 
for children to develop language, okay? So what I want to do now is to share a presentation with you and then to have a discussion together, okay? Does that sound good to you? Could I share the screen? Yes. Good. And if you have any contributions or questions, you can please uh, stop me. Uh, before that, I have a question about the, the activity in, in Eminus. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a full question, but I don't want to, to fail my, my homework. And you mentioned that we, that we can use uh, PowerPoint or Prezi, but actually I use a lot of uh, Canva application to, to do the presentations. So I don't know if I can use it in this case. Yeah, um, what's your name? I'm sorry, but I can't see you there. Oscar. Hi, ah, Oscar. Yeah, of yeah. course. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't no recognize worries. your voice. I'm sorry. Yeah, Oscar, Canva is great. You know, I really like working with Canva. You can work with flashcards, infographics, and yeah. uh, videos. Of course, you can use it. Sure. OK, thank I you know. so much. Yeah, well, I mean, everything you want to contribute with it is, uh, is uh, um, brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, I'm going to share now the video, the video, the, um, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation. It's here. Okay, this is the presentation. It's on social constructivism, the role of interaction according to Vygotsky. Uh, well, Vygotsky is a, is a very well-known scholar. Uh, he was Russian. He was into um, into the academic field, but he was more into social studies. I actually decided to come up with the following quotation for uh, the beginning of the presentation, what a child can do today with assistance, she will be able to do by herself tomorrow. So um, it's it was a turning point for education, you know, this is social cultural theory um, I could see from your work, you know, from your tasks and and, and your uh, activities that you actually grasp the most important concepts of the theory. Um, internalization, the zone of proximal development, and while well, the role of more knowledgeable peers for children to develop language. And actually, since uh, by Godsky's work, language started to become a more important element for cognitive development. So the difference between Piaget, which was the previous presentation, and Vygotsky's theory is basically a new concept of intelligence, social interaction, and the role of language for um, interacting in different cultures, okay? So uh, I think after this presentation, I'm going to share with you another video. Hopefully you will be able to watch it. It's a video on how language shapes the way we think, um, depending on the on culture, depending on interaction. And it's very interesting because it actually focused on Vygotsky's idea of language. Okay, those were the beginnings of, um, you know, the importance of language on cognitive development. Then, of course, Brunner started, you know, going into in, in depth, exploring uh, the role of language. But um, I think it's uh, going to be um, really helpful for you to discuss and reflect on the um, the importance of instructions, the importance of language, the importance of routines, and the concept of a new concept of intelligence. It's not about multiple intelligences, but it's a new concept of intelligence such as the zone of proximal development, which means that instructions play a paramount role for helping students to be challenged. 
yeah, not frustrated, but challenged instead. Well, here you have, you know, um, one of the um, main ideas regarding language for Vygotsky. Language provides a child with a new tool, opening up, opening up new opportunities for doing things and organizing new information. So language actually plays the role of the vehicle, you know, between in previous information, new information, and interaction so that they can internalize, you know, knowledge and learning can take place. Some of you defined um, internalization very well. You know, I actually found a brilliant pieces of homework and, and, and I think I'm, I'm going to share some of them with you, you know, so that you can discuss uh, the concepts. I think um, a big correction discussion among your peers is um, needed. So uh, the work you have been doing in this um, month, month and a half, can be shared and can be explored by everyone. Uh, your work was, you know, amazing. Um, I was really happy to check your your charts, you know, your comparative charts, and you included quite relevant information. I think it's it's valuable. It can it can even work for research, you know. Uh, language and internal processes, according to Vygotsky. Well, as you explained this, the internal processes uh, have to do with the basis of Piaget, you know, the interaction with the environment, but also, uh, you know, the internalization happens once we go from the general to the particular. That is, in other words, um, we learn from others. And this actually makes sense because really from stories and we might seem to repeat stories, you know, as if we were telling it. Um, we still live from the Greeks, you know, and, and their stories. And then we use that knowledge for our own purposes in a meaningful way, you know. And it's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong process in which we keep on internalizing, you know, what's happening to us, what's happening to others, so that it can be meaningful for our life, for our context. Well, and here we have one more time the importance of a private speech and oral production. This inner dialogue that Piaget started thinking of. And, and, and of course, uh, Vygotsky followed up the idea of this inner speech, private speech, in order to uh, internalize what we experience with others and to express it later on, okay? The process of internalization is basically um, the way learning takes place, you know. Um, another words for uh, internalizing knowledge might be incorporating, which is a very interesting word, you know, has to do with your uh, corpus, you know, with the information inside you, acquisition, learning, you describe this uh, transference of knowledge, you know, uh, from the interaction uh, in an interpersonal manner to the intrapersonal way, that is, for your own purposes. Um, well, uh, acquisition, you know, uh, regarding language can be uh, suitable for describing this process. Well, children will learn through social interaction, eventually internalizing the use of language. Internalized language is that language available to a child to use without having to go through this step of mentally translating. So if we explore this definition by uh, Vygotsky, um, you know, well, it's not a definition, it's a statement. We can see how important instruction can be and and we could also 
uh, identify that acquisition processes are implied. They are immersed regarding a language. Okay. Um, if you can remember the previous presentations, we also check the, um, 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 you know, one of the of the L1 acquisition theories, and we check how um, bilingual people might struggle, you know, with uh, interference constraints, uh, and you know, language for Vygotsky. Uh, to a certain extent, could be linked with Krashen's idea of, of a language acquisition. Okay, According to them, language acquisition can take place at any stage in life. It's just about comprehensible input for Krashen and well, the help of a more knowledgeable peer for, for Vygotsky. But regarding Vygotsky's work, the social environment plays a paramount role. Culture and the social context actually make up the learning and language development umbrellas. You know, um, but in the middle of this process, uh, we have the figure of a teacher. Or the figure of a parent, the figure of a more knowledgeable partner who is actually enhancing the children's zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development is actually what children can do with the help of a more knowledgeable peer. Okay, it's not about you know tasks that could be too challenging for children and that might uh, uh, produce feelings of frustration, anxiety and stress. Or it's not about, you know, uh, keeping up in the comfort zone. It's helping them to actually go beyond, but establishing language goals, okay? Um, Basically, the zone of proximal development is could be a synonym of intelligence, okay? Because every single child has got a specific zone that could be worked. You know, uh, we have the definition of Pinto here. The zone of proximal development is the zone between the current knowledge of the child and the potential knowledge achievable with some help from a more knowledgeable peer or adult. There are some pedagogical implications regarding the zone of proximal development, of course. If we think of a more knowledgeable peer, well, working in groups might be important, right? Peer correction is important. Working in pairs, in trios, you know, in small groups, Separate tables are important regarding seating arrangement, classroom management. Uh, more implications for this zone of proximal development is giving instructions in a clear way, you know, and focusing on language goals, but also, you know, cognitive goals. When, we, when you're working with children, you need to bear in mind that you are also a, enhancing lower thinking skills and high oral thinking skills. This is another figure, another picture of the zone of proximal development and how the child um, can actually do things and can speak a little bit uh, or can produce language. And the things, you know, that a child can do with the help of a more knowledgeable peer actually um, transforms that knowledge into new uh, uh, skills, new um, abilities, you know, and learning can take place. 
Well, you have already done a couple of activities regarding um, the Vygotsky. So I want to link this um, theory with uh, the social cultural studies of Brunner, which are uh, actually connected. That's why I decided to go from Piaget to Vygotsky and then Brunner. Um, because uh, according to Brunner, all children have natural curiosity and a desire to become competent at various learning tasks. We all know the characteristics of children already. They're curious, they're energetic, you know, they're looking forward to participating. Um, they, they are eager to be there in, in, your, in your classrooms, but even online, you know. Um, and when a task presented to them is too difficult, they become bored. This is something we have explored. You know, they have short concentration spans and we teachers need to create dynamic activities. We have already discussed it. Um, but we also need to challenge them because they're really intelligent. Um, how can we enhance these challenging tasks? Well, a good idea is to focus on Bloom's taxonomy, and that's going to be one of our tasks, you know, uh, for after covering um, unit one and two, we're going to design a couple of instructions for children to follow and those instructions are going to be based on Bloom's taxonomy of thinking skills whether lower or higher and it's going to be really interesting how to use the taxonomy because it works for designing activities for setting goals language objectives but also for evaluating children you know it works for E evaluation. Well, we also uh, work on the definition of a scaffolding. It was in your charts. In well, in short, scaffolding refers to the steps taken to reduce the degrees of freedom in carrying out some task. So it's delimited, you know, so that children can concentrate on the difficult skill they are in the process of acquiring. Um, well, you can see here that e scaffolding is a strategy, okay? It's a strategy that um, sometimes, you know, has been referred to as uh, noticing. But the difference between noticing and scaffolding is that you actually are able to design scaffolding before your classes, before your activities. While you are implementing an activity, yeah, you tried to make students focus on what you want them to. Okay, that's not the same. But the scaffolding, you know, are strategies that you could design uh, preventing constraints, difficulties, and thinking of children as a whole in a holistic way. You know, taking into account everything we are studying, characteristics, styles, personalities, strategies, uh, um, context, you know, um, cognitive abilities, etc. Well, as I told you, scaffolding is an instructional strategy which ensures that the child can gain confidence and take control of the task or some parts of the task as soon as they are willing and able to. Our task in this case is to help them to learn by offer, offering systematic support. Why systematic? Because it's a whole procedure, okay? Scaffolding can take place in one activity, in a set of activities, in a lesson, in a unit, or, you know, in a syllabus design. So that's what I tried to get at when I was referring to scaffolding as a strategy that, that you can think of before actually teaching, you know, be, be, before the, you practical. 
So uh, how can a scaffolding become systematic? Okay, by setting goals, by focusing on language, by providing routines, okay, by means of by means of a, a approaches, you know, by following certain methodologies for evaluation, certain approaches, and actually, you know, uh, what the course of teaching English to young learners aims at is to explore every single element that's going to be useful for you to scaffold children. You know, this is one of the goals of, of the of the course. Well, while uh, while uh, we had the CPD, you know, the zone of proximal development, um, interaction takes place. Okay, the adult encourages the child by saying "good job," "well done," "very well," "keep working hard," or you know, just. Um, Praising them, okay. They feel good, you know. They they really appreciate that. The adult also makes sure that the learner stays on track, focused, and motivated to finish the task. How? Well, by designing suitable tasks, you know, by keeping time organized, by thinking of diversity. And this support is uh, adjusted to the needs of the individual child. There are certain schools, you know, I could give you an example of a, of, of a school in, in Jalapa. Yeah, I think a, um, it's a very famous one, which follows a, a constructivist approach. Okay, children are free to go around the classroom depending on the activity and yeah, say depending on uh, um, working in groups or working individually and the and the classroom is divided you know uh, into sections because every single day they have a schedule okay and this is what I what what, what Brunner suggests doing you know following routines on Monday, they have a schedule. On Tuesday, they have another one. On Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So they know the expectations of, you know, the lesson, the expectations of the teacher, the expectations of their classmates, and they follow their roles, you know. They actually have roles. The idea of working with the zone of proximal development and providing with the scaffolding strategies is to organize your classroom. And this is something that has to do with classroom management, but it also has to do with your planning, you know, and your planning is not classroom management, but it's your responsibility. And how are you going to plan by taking into account, by taking into consideration internal and external factors such as the curriculum, uh, the children's motivation, the philosophy of the school, the book you're following, the evaluation, you know, the discussion with parents. So uh, this is a, a just an example I wanted to share with you because the organization of your classroom can enhance, you know, the zone of proximal development and scaffolding, how to store material, you know, how to move your chairs, how to move desks, how to work in circles, etc. We're going to check it, you know, step by step. This is in a, an illustration of a, um, scaffolding. Uh, you can see the comparison there between the CPD and this scaffolding. Uh, be, because it's quite similar, you know, the current understanding of children is at the bottom. The uh, challenging tasks that can become overwhelming or 
frustrating for children are out of reach here. But if you plan properly and you design your activities and you provide with systematic procedures for children to feel secure, you can work on their, pro on their zone of proximal development and you might help them, you know. Of course, this is about, you know, working on your sensibility and, and, and sensitivity as, as well. Let's check a couple of tasks, you know, from very particular examples rather than the syllabus. Well, to make children be interested in the task, how can you do that by means of contextualization? Okay, by knowing their uh, characteristics, likes and dislikes. Try to make the task easy, okay? Um, divide it, follow a short periods of time, you know? And um, a couple of you people actually provided with ideas of, um, you know, that, that could be um, activities, warm-up activities. And, and, and some of you, uh, I can remember, suggested using um, very short songs, you know, when they are getting distracted, yeah, you can uh, uh, catch their attention again, you know, by singing a song. And there are more, more uh, um, strategies that we're going to check when we focus on, on the approaches. Well, um, effective scaffolded tasks by uh, keeping the child on track towards completing the task and focusing on what it is important. Uh, pointing out what was important to do or show the child other ways of doing tasks or parts of the task, control the uh, children's frustration, and demonstrate an, an idealized version of the task, okay? Giving examples, um, being empathetic, and of course you need to be creative and you need to be full of energy as well. Watch a video of a format routines and little rituals. I think it's, it's going to be helpful for you. It's going to give you a couple of ideas to follow in, in your classrooms and for the following tasks. It could, be, it could be useful for the following tasks. Well, here you have an idea of noticing, which is also relevant for scaffolding and systematization. Um, teachers can help children to attend what is relevant by suggesting uh, praising the significant, providing focusing activities, encouraging rehearsal, repetition, or even drills without, you know, um, being um, afraid of using a, an eclectic approach, you know, using different methodologies. Uh, being explicit about organization, reminding, going back to the main goal, um, uh, going back to the previous task, modeling, um, and you know, giving examples, okay, um, helping them with uh, the activities. This is, you know, um, to um, make children focus on what you want them to regarding language and learning as a whole. Well, um, According to Brunner, children acquire a way of representing recurrent regular, regularities in their environment. For example, routines, and this is what uh, Brunner actually shed light on. You know, routines were a paramount strategy for working on scaffolding and for learning to take place and for language to be developed, okay? So um, routines are actually very important and some of your suggestions were um, remarkable, okay? 
Um, these are features of events that allow the scaffolding to take place. Okay, routines. I combine the security of what uh, the, uh, the previous knowledge with the suspense of what is about to happen. You know, of course, you know, when you're working with children, you need to be careful because they need to know what you expect them to do. So it, they need everything to be planned so that they can feel secure. Little rituals, OK. Think of a remarkable teacher you had in the past. Why do you remember him or her? Yeah. Any kind of teacher it could be, you know, math or history, science. And then think of your own characteristics as a potential teacher. Well, some of you are pre-service teachers already. You know. Think of you as a teacher. Are you an easygoing teacher? Are you relaxed? Are you a cool teacher? Or you are a demanding one? You know, um, try to recognize your characteristics. And then think of uh, the following questions for your reflection. Would you like to be everyone's favorite teacher? You know, that every single child is just yelling your name and, you know, um, and something that, you know, happens to teachers at the beginning that they feel really proud of their profession or the job when they're called teachers. You know, this is something that uh, has been studied uh, in, 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 in different contexts. Not in, Mexi in Mexico, because in Mexico, the emotional, develop the emotional dimension of being a teacher, well, needs to be more studied. But um, the findings uh, so far, you know, the data states that emotions, positive emotions, motivate teachers to continue with their training, you know, with their specialization, with a master's degree, so that they can become um, professionals, you know, and they can develop. Would you like your students to admire you? To, uh, would you like them to learn from you or what are your expectations as a teacher? Those questions are important because they're going to be defining your routines and your rituals in the classroom. They are needed. They are needed because they are the basis of a scaffolding and they also enhance the approach you decide to use in your classroom. Of course, you know, taking into consideration both internal and external factors. Well, just think of the characteristics of previous teachers on your own and the ones you are expecting to show your um, potential students, your potential children. Well, another important point regarding Brunner's work was in this um, in research on the uh, modes of representation. Those modes of representation might be compared to uh, Piaget's stages of development. However, you know, there are certain differences in one of the and, you know, most important ones is that these modes of representation can move, you know, backwards and forwards, while these stages, you know, once you overcome a stage, you cannot go back. It all depends on the individual, you know, and the idea of intelligence that uh, continued to be present with Brunner's work, which was the zone of proximal development. You have these modes of representation, action-based, image-based, and language-based. There is plenty of research regarding this language base and the implications of this mode of representation. 
because it's a turning point between abstract thinking, you know, and the uh, imaginary cognitive development. That's why, you know, the critical period hypothesis was in a line, you know, between um, ages and um, it actually demonstrated by means of a couple of studies that once you overcome a stage in a, in a mode of representation, it's difficult for children, well, for individuals to develop um, 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 accent related affairs, for example, right? Has to do with pronunciation and in a communicative competence. But after seven years old, and once you know you, we talk about 10 year olds, abstract thinking can take place and communicative competence can be present because they can think of language. But you know, before that stage, they can't. So um, it's it would be good for you to compare, you know, stages and uh, representation of these modes so that you can come up with conclusions for um, for a um, language phenomena. Well, here you have a description for each for inactive representation. Well, involves it involves encoding action based information and storing it in our memory. The child represents past events through motor responses. Iconic representation is where information is stored visually in the form of images and mental picture in the mind's eye. Okay, it has to do with the unique work as well of the child, according to John, you know, and personality types. Symbolic representation is where information is stored in the form of codes, symbols, such as language structures. Here you have a comparison. You know, I tried to um, uh, summarize your ideas regarding your comparative chart, comparative chart in, in adaptation, curiosity, commonalities, and of course, uh, differences uh, uh, between the theories. Piaget might be in the middle, of course, you have already described it, you know, but there are some things in common, you know, and that actually uh, could make us think of the importance of Piaget and how this uh, was actually a, a point in a cognitive development for everybody to continue studying, you know, including Vygotsky and, and, and Brunner. Um, you have a cognitive structures, a, a active participants, you know, a, the development of a symbols abstraction, okay? And of course, you have these agreements here. A development is a continuous process, not a series of stages, you know, that's, I think that's the most important um, difference I could rescue from from your work, from your uh, from your charts, I'm sorry. The development of language is a cause, not a consequence of cognitive development. And that's why I decided to um, provide with a link for you to watch video on language. It's a tech talk, you know, it's going to be really friendly. For, it's a six minutes long video that you can easily watch. You can speed up cognitive development. You don't have to wait for the child to be ready. And that's why you can use the CPD and scaffolding strategies. The involvement of adults and more knowledgeable peers makes a big difference. So uh, Brunner and Vygotsky focus more on social interaction and you know the world of children with the help of the word of adults. Uh, the symbolic uh, thought does not replace earlier modes of representation. 
OK, that's something I was referring to when comparing PHA and uh, Brunner's modes of representation. Well, this is full of words, but I'm going to try to summarize it. I place it that way because I thought it was important. How children learn. Children are active learners and thinkers. OK, this is PHA. Children construct knowledge from actively interacting with the physical environment in developmental stages. They take actions, they explore, and learning takes place. Now, according to Vygotsky, children learn through social interaction. Children construct knowledge through other people, through interaction with adults. Adults work actively with children in the ZPD. OK, um, the ZPD might be equal to the difference between the child's capacity to solve problems by their own on or uh, and sorry, um, uh, his abilities to solve them with assistance. And we have children learn effectively through scaffolding by adults. This is Brunner's theory. The adult's role is very important in a child's learning process. Like Vygotsky, Brunner focused on the importance of language in a child's cognitive development. He shows how the adult uses scaffolding to guide the child's language learning through finely tuned talk. Okay. And this could be actually seen in instructions, whether you know, uh, oral or written instructions. There are a couple of educational implications for the importance of language, and that is the teacher's talk, you know, the use of L1, the use of L2. And you could actually read that when you explore Cameron's, uh, Cameron's book, um, the use of L1, the use of L2, the ads and cons, you know, um, for some people, you know, for some scholars such as Moon, uh, Cameron, Pinter, the use of L1 might be useful in foreign language, foreign language contexts, while for other scholars, specifically for crashing, the use of L1 uh, deters language acquisition. So there other strategies for crashing for you to um, get across, for you to focus, focus on um, on the objectives of your class, okay, and for acquiring language. Well, we're going to check this in a, in detail with the following presentation of crashing. I think. If you can see, I think everything is intertwined. You know, all the theories actually um, merge. The main main ideas, you know, they, they, they do it. But we need to know the differences and the commonalities for the implications in our classrooms. Here you have a, a reference, um, Jane Moon. You can uh, you can uh, find there. I'm gonna share this link with you in the um, in the chat so that you can explore uh, uh, children learning English. For you, you're going to focus on the use of L1 and L2 according to Moon. Okay, you're going to read Moon, and after reading her, you're going to be critical at um, Crashen's statements. OK, and it's going to be your decision and your conclusion by means of reflection, whether the use of, of, of L1 might be useful or not. OK, in, in your discussion of Krashen's hypothesis, remember that you need to participate in a forum, uh, Krashen's um, hypothesis and in, in, in comprehensible input, and the silent period is going to be involved there as well. So uh, try to consider, to bear in mind what Moon states and what Krashen argues regarding the use of L1 
and L3, okay, uh, has impact on, you know, uh, the interaction in your classroom. It's the way you want to build up a community of practice in your classroom. So if you use L1, it's because you're following one approach. If you use only the L2, it's because you need more scaffolding strategies and working on a, every single child CPD. Okay, so it's got implications, but that's something we're going to discuss together. Here you have more uh, references, well, Pinta, uh, Halliwell, and Wood, Bruner, etc. Okay, I'm going to share this one with you in the chat in a moment. Professor? Yes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, give me a sec. Me escucho con oh, mucho eco, ¿verdad? I'm listening to you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Yes. Uh, by Gotsky and Brunner's theory are both based on social interaction, but we when when they talk about help by adults the difference between Vygotsky and Brunner's theory is that scaffolding is the um, separation into steps and in Vygotsky it's just help or what Okay, thank you, Bali. I guess that was a question or repeated statement. Vale? You there? Well, okay. Yes, I'm here. If we think of Vygotsky, okay, we need to be really critical, okay? Because first of all, he was Russian, okay? We need to take into consideration everything. And you know, this Russian philosophy of life, you know, in the 19th century, in the, in the um, mid 20th century, was a, um, actually proposing, you know, a different way of thinking regarding paradigms, okay? And the paradigm that people was people were used to was this cognitive constructivism. And cognitive constructivism had to do with the environment, behaviorism, etc. So Vygotsky proposed, you know, a brilliant idea, you know, a, a, he had a brilliant contribution on social studies. Because for him, you know, language was not only about a language acquisition device, but it was about interaction. When Vygotsky talked about help, he was referring to interaction and the importance of interaction between child to child or between parent to child or between child and teacher. Okay. That's what we want. What, what we wanted us to focus on. What we, what what he wanted us to understand from social interaction, was that we are not alone. You know that language can be developed by means of talking to others, and by listening to them, and by expressing and by sharing feelings. You know, and you know, uh, he actually shed light on the fact that culture and language transform our perceptions, transform language, and language has an impact on individuals, and individuals have impact on language. But for Brunner, you know, on the other hand, for Brunner, although it's not that different, here has to do with a systematic procedure. Okay, it's not only interaction. For Brunner, interaction is important. Okay, 
but language is explored in detail so that we can systematize procedures for learning to take place. Not only language, but any kind of learning. For Brunner, you know, uh, language became the main vehicle for children to learn. And how is it different, you know, the term help between Vygotsky and Brunner? Well, it's really straightforward. Systematization has to do with the knowledge of an adult, you know, or a young adult, you know, or even a child, yeah, um, that is employed in order to help systematically, okay, with in, in a conscious manner, okay, in a conscious manner to help a child in order to achieve a learning goal. While for Vygotsky, you know, it was all about interaction without following procedures, without following steps, without focusing on rituals that actually enhanced scaffolding, you know, and, and scaffolding is a strategy that takes several, um, several strategies in the classroom, outside the classroom, in the first institution, you know, it's, it's, a, a, it's a different perception. You know, it's a different perception because culture impacts language, but language is the main vehicle for understanding the world. OK, so I think that Brunner's contribution was 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 actually that, you know, Brunner's contribution um, shed light on language. And and this has been discussed, you know, through years. We don't even know what reality is. You know, not even quantum mechanics, you know, not even science. And language is also a phenomenon that's been explored and it's really complex. But, you know, uh, so far when we talk, when, when, when we think of Brunner, nobody had focused on language for understanding you know what is happening to us so language became a you know very important for a structuralists you know for psychologists for sociologists for anthropologists because um these pedagogical implications you know that can happen in the classroom but you know they happen every day you know that's uh, since we are born social interaction and uh, and scaffolding you know what i what i can um provide with is you know this video of you know uh the, the role of language i think that if we understand the different perceptions the different theories of language it could be easier to discriminate uh, both different theories Vygotsky's and Brunner's PHA is a little bit clearer, you know, because um, um, it has to do with their relationship with the environment. But um, for um, Vygotsky and for Brunner, we can actually find a lot of commonalities because um, um, social interaction and, and routines are involved, you know, they are intertwined. Okay. But I, I'm going to share with you the video. I'm going to share with you um, um, one of the comparative charts. You know, I, I think that's going to be uh, really helpful for you. I'm going to share it with you all, you know, by email after we finish this presentation. Is anybody there? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vale. Thank you for your participation, Valeria. You're always uh, contributing to to the to the discussion. That's something I really appreciate. Does anybody have a comment? Does anybody have a a question? Hello. 
No. Well, in the chat, in the chat, you can see that I shared the link of uh, L1 and L2, the use of L1 and L2, Moon's work for you to read before finishing up your activities on crashing. Okay. And I think it would be good to have a presentation regarding crashing's hypothesis after you finish your activities, just the way we did today. Okay. Yeah, teacher, it's okay. Okay, teacher, thank you. Well, yeah, you have, thank you, teacher. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I feel you're here. You. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think you have until a uh, next Monday for working on your activity, so you still have time. Um, organize yourself. Try to watch the videos I share. Uh, and the videos I'm about to share with you. I think I'm going to share one video and I'm going to share one a uh, chart with you. All, OK, for comparing the three different theories. Right. And um, and well, I will be checking your work as soon as you get it ready. Teacher, just a question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we have to send you the link for our video. But it is through Google Drive, so how can we share it? We um, you can place it in a Word file. That would oh, be okay. Yeah. What about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Do you have another question? No. Uh, teacher. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We we will see you next week. Next Wednesday or for Monday. Wednesday Dang. next class. Right. Let me see. Yeah, I think we're going to have a class on Wednesday, 21st. OK, thank you. Wednesday, 21st. Well, we're going to have a presentation and uh, we're going to try to discuss here. OK. OK. Any, yes. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you. Well, if you don't have any more comments or questions, I think um, we can stop the session. I'm, I'm recording the session. I'm going to stop recording and I'm going to share this presentation to uh,